states that his mercies are new every morning and his compassions don't fail. And if you've been a believer any time, uh, for any, any amount of time, we, we can look back and remember the grace shown us at our, at our conversion. We can look forward to the grace of heaven. But the good news of the gospel is, is that his saving, rescuing grace is for the right here, right now. And we want to encourage you today to continue worshiping as, uh, as we move into the word. I do have a, a few um, a comments, a few announcements. But again, we just, uh, and, and these announcements are, are part of church life, so they, they can be part of worship. But I just want to encourage you to open your heart to the Word of God today and allow the Word of God, which is living and active, to, to literally change you. The scripture says that we go from strength to strength until we each appear before the Lord. Again, we just want to mention for any folks who are here as guests, uh, this might be your first time, that uh, this little green guy is in your bulletin, and it has a place for uh, prayer requests, it has a place for um, an email address and mailing address if you'd like us to let you know and, and forward our weekly service schedule to you, as well as uh, give you links to uh, the, the sermons uh, themselves. So again, that's uh, if, if you would like us to contact you, fill that out, drop that in the offering box, in the entry. Also, we've done this for a number of years, but Samaritan's Purse, uh, which is run by Franklin Graham and his uh, association, is, uh, is one of the top uh, aid organizations in the world and they do they go into places where it's very dangerous they go into harm's way um, on on another note they also recognize that there are children that live in third world countries that too uh, are in very very difficult situations and so this is called christmas child samaritan's purse operation christmas child and we have these in the foyer <clears throat> and basically you can have one for a boy or a girl but you you take this you'll fill it with items that they say will make it through the borders and and bless a kid, bless a child. And so there's instructions on how to do that. The deadline is the uh, 29th, and so we are running out of time, but uh, I just wanna encourage you, if you feel led to do that, to do it, and to bless some kid um, who will indeed be blessed. Uh, Monday night is Living Well and Spending Less. This is a women's Bible study on, on finance. And this week it'll be uh, part four, 7 p.m. at Yvonne Christner's home. Oh, Yvonne, where are you? Oh, that's right. Okay. Following. 10.30. I do read occasionally. Thank you for that correction. Also, the high school uh, service for tomorrow night is being canceled because of the Young Life uh, banquet tomorrow night. And then finally, uh, uh, the new Grace Harbor app is being released uh, this Thursday by, uh, by app stores. And I'll let uh, Paul speak to that. But again, we're looking to increase connectivity and the, um, and the ease with which we share information with each other in, in our living community under Christ. So Paul? Oh, and Jackie, come on up. Well, the women of Grace Harbor have a joyful, wonderful ministry. And I want to direct your attention, ladies, to the little inset on the bulletin. Um, we have a new baby to celebrate. She's not here yet, but she's expected any day now. And that's uh, Lindy Kemp's baby. We don't want to have any baby or new mommy, especially a first-time mommy, go uncelebrated. So Carolyn is hosting this shower in a couple of weeks. It's going to be November 4th at her house. And I know some of you ladies are thinking, oh, I don't even know Lindy. But that's the point. None of us really know her. She's, they're kind of a new family, she and her husband, Kadar. And we just want to um, celebrate her, celebrate this baby, and just affirm her within our church family. Um, at the shower, we'll have great snacks. We'll pray for her and play a couple of fun party games. And the present is not the big deal. You, the gift of your presence is the big deal. So please come and just affirm her and celebrate with us this new life that's going to be arriving any time now. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie. And when she says any time, the due date was the 18th. So that uh, tells you that they're ready. And uh, certainly uh, we are a church that, like everyone on earth, deals with the realities of living in mortal bodies 
and looking forward to that which is resurrection and immortal. But uh, the events of birth and death are both that which is a part of our life. We happen to be a church that celebrates many more arrivals than we do funerals. It just reflects uh, the demographic of our area and of our group. But in both these areas, we come alongside each other. And uh, whether it's in baby showers or the take them a meal, uh, at various times, people will be on the receiving end. But as uh, the scripture says, freely you have received, freely give. And that means that uh, when we have received a blessing in a certain way, that when the time comes that it's someone else's, then we participate in encouraging them. That's the way the body of Christ is to live with each other. Uh, I'll go into prayer, but there's one specific one. In your Bible, notice uh, there on Saturday that it says there would be a baptism coming up this coming Saturday. And this is for a woman who has recently uh, been attending here, and she's given me the full permission to disclose that she's here because of being in recovery. And uh, she told me right away after meeting Car Carrie that she wanted to be baptized. Uh, I've been gone all week. I got here last night just about less than an hour before the service started. But as I was leaving the airport, Carrie was there and uh, looked very troubled and I hoped everything was going well and she said, uh, uh, my mother's dying and I have to leave. And so I prayed with her right there, kind of somewhat obstructing the doorway, but uh, she went that way and I hurried uh, to come here to be here for the service. But uh, she is uh, appreciating our prayer and we can, in a special way, uh, remember her today that God continues by His Spirit to work in her and to bring comfort in this situation. We'll remember Skip and our uh, mission uh, team that is getting ready to, soon to depart for, uh, for uh, Mombasa, Kenya. Celeste Dinko, Rob Solspak, Stuart Pook, Caleb, and Dylan Warren. And they will be going to be with missionaries we support that are our focus this weekend, Sean and Jenny Nuccio. So let's go to the Lord together in prayer. And Father, we do thank you that we can come to you. We come because of Jesus Christ, and we recognize that as we approach you, we are approaching the one who is the eternal God, who has no beginning, no ending, who can just by the mere thought or, or, or word speak the universe into existence, who has no limit, not only in, in your power and ability, but your knowledge and your wisdom. You are outside of time. You, you are so much more than we can comprehend, and we'll consider that a little bit more here in just a few moments. But we also recognize that you became one of us, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. And through what he did on the cross, bearing our sin on himself, paid that penalty all of our, the guilt of our sin paid for, and life, forgiveness offered to us freely through trust in Him. And through Jesus Christ now, we can approach you, this mighty God, and call you Father. But not only that, to be in Christ and to be indwelt by your Spirit, to be able to uh, recognize that our position, our new identity of, is that the uh, life of Christ is within us. And now we can recognize that we are clothed in that righteousness and we are exalted together with him. So may we be ready to uh, let our, your Spirit speak into our minds and hearts today. And we do come to you as instructed to pray for one another, for those, those women among us who are anticipating the birth of a child, and there are those here today. There are those who are facing some issues in their life and struggles, and we pray that they might be able to surrender and allow you to come alongside to strengthen. And may we be your agents to, to encourage one another. And we pray for Carrie. And I don't know any of the details about her mother other than that she's dying. But may she be strengthened and encouraged. And may your comfort be brought into that situation. May you use it as a means by which Jesus Christ 
Christ is seen in glory. We pray, too, for Skip. Encourage him and give him strength. We look forward to his return to be with us again and participating here in ministry. Thank you for his heart for you and for your people. We as a church continue to trust you as we look toward the completion of this project that we started to expand this building and thereby multiply the fruitfulness. May our people here, a part of this church congregation, be faithful in their stewardship, trusting you and putting you first in, in all areas, but I pray that it might be a testimony to the young ones, to the new believers, to those who have not yet learned the, the blessings of, of stewardship, that they might see that as a church we trusted and you did not fail. And so we pray for this. We pray for those who are getting ready to go to Mombasa, and right now there is this issue of getting into Turkey, where Celeste is going to visit her close friend Catherine Watson, one of our missionaries. We don't know if that's going to be able to happen or not. We ask that that door be opened if that's what you have and we continue to pray that you would make their time there fruitful that getting there and back safely and feeling well will also be a part of this experience in our church will be drawn closer in partnership to the Nuccios who are working there we pray for your encouragement on them today and now I pray for the enablement of your spirit as we come to this portion of scripture that I might be able to speak clearly of that truth which is from you and we ask this in Jesus name amen Some years back, Carolyn and I were browsing through a store in Sun River, Oregon, which is just south of Bend. And I was looking at some books there on the rack, and one caught my attention. The title of the book was, What Were They Thinking? And just browsing in it quickly, I realized that it was a series of, of stories of people who did very foolish things that caused people to ask, what in the world were they thinking? And I found it attractive, I don't know exactly why, possibly because by reading about other people's foolishness, I might feel more superior that I wasn't that way. I'm not going to open that door to self-analysis, but anyway, I did buy the book. The one that really caught my attention that I wanted to read was the story of a particular woman, man by the name of William Henry, or nicknamed Burrow Schmidt, also called the human mole. In the early part of the previous century, this man decided to dig a tunnel. And for the next 32 years, he dug this tunnel through solid granite, through Copper Mountain, which is in the area of the Mojave Desert. The tunnel extended for one half mile. It was an interesting thing for me to read, and everybody questioned, why would this one man set out to dig this tunnel and spend 32 years of his life in the process? But there's more details about it than that, and it wasn't until I looked up the pictures that, that I even asked more, what, is, what was he thinking? Because I looked at the area where he dug the tunnel and asked myself, why would he need a tunnel? You can walk over the hill. Not only that, that while he was digging the tunnel, a road was built that made the to tunnel totally unnecessary. It was an area of, of mining, and he did pass on his way through, pass by some uh, veins of, of mineral, but he was not going to be deterred by mining these things from finishing his tunnel. And so uh, he uh, continued to work on this. He was very frugal. He did pause to do some work in order to earn enough money to live. He made his clothes out of burlap and uh, patched his shoes with tin can lids. He was frugal to the point that he didn't want to be extravagant on the length of the fuses for his dynamite, and that resulted in a few uh, injuries along the way. But uh, here he was, uh, Henry, the, the other end, both ends of the tunnel, making me say, why? that he uh, extracted no ore, and when he completed his tunnel, he walked away. And uh, the tunnel still exists there as the marvel for people to visit and ask the question again, just what was he thinking? Now, uh, I come to John chapter 20, verse 9. Earlier in our, in our passage that we are considering, and about the disciples, and I read, For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. 
And the passage and the point we are considering as we enter into this study today, and that which your children, if you have them, are studying in their classes, has to do with the evening of that day on which Jesus rose from the dead. But it, I read this, as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. But yet they've spent three and a half years with Jesus. And we look back in John and to the second chapter when he changed the water to wine, which was his first sign. The second in chapter four when he healed that official son. And chapter five when he healed the man who had been at the pool for 38 years. They had observed him doing all of these things. They had listened to what he taught, but it says they weren't getting it. They were a part of his miracle in chapter 6 of feeding the 5,000. They distributed the food, and then they heard him speak of him being the bread of life, and in chapter 7, the living water. He was the light of the world in chapter 8, and proved it in chapter 9 by opening the eyes of a man who had been born blind. In chapter 10, he was the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep. And in chapter 11, he demonstrated his power over death by raising his friend Lazarus from the dead. He had spent extensive time in that last week, as John records, explaining that he was going to be departing that he was going to be going to the cross, that he would be ascending but would send the Spirit. He had explained all of these things, answered their questions, and yet we come to chapter 20, and John, one of the disciples, looks back and says, as yet they did not understand the Scripture that he must rise from the dead. And I don't want to act like I'm better than those men, but I look at it and say, well, just what were you thinking through all of this time as he was doing these things and teaching you these things? Well, let's look at that scripture, verse 19. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now three things here, and the first of those is this, that as risen king, just as Jesus entered this room, to be with his disciples in the state that they were, so he can do that with us, with you and I. That Jesus enters your place of fear and failure with his peace. For we see here that the disciples' hearts were filled with fear. The doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. This is still the day of the resurrection. And this is the, at least the fifth appearance that he has made. He appeared to Mary Magdalene first, then the other women, to Peter, and the two Emmaus disciples, which were the topic of last week's message. And then now it is ten disciples because Judas has hung himself and Thomas, doubting Thomas, saw no use together with them any longer. And so they gathered together, these ten men, for fear of the Jews. Their leader had been ex executed to eradicate his movement, and logic would say that in order to completely wipe it out, they should be killed too to finish the job. So they're meeting secretly at night with fear behind locked doors. Some 50 days from now, things will be entirely different after Pentecost, and these are the same men who will stand out for their boldness. We see something of the nature of the resurrection body. That of Christ is the prototype of that which will be ours someday, that it's not limited by, by physical structures such as walls or doors, that he could pass right through. Now, when you read that the stone was rolled away from the tomb, it wasn't rolled away to let Jesus out. 
He was already out of the tomb when he was raised from the dead. The stone was rolled away so we can see in and rejoice and shout glory. The Lord is risen. It's odd, though, that these men were actually afraid that evening. The women had already reported to them that Jesus was alive. The two Emmaus disciples had come and added their personal witness. It's no surprise then, as we read in Mark 16, a parallel passage that Jesus calls them out for their unbelief and their hardness of heart. So they were in fear and they were well, well, well aware of their failure. This is the first time for most of these, except for Peter, to be able to have any conversation with Christ. The last time they had been with him was Thursday evening at the Garden of Gethsemane. And it might have been very natural and expected that when Jesus was to now come before them, there would be a, a rather stern look on his face saying, Hey guys, let's, let's stop for a minute and go back to Thursday. Remember when the soldiers came? Peter, that was a nice little gesture with the sword thing, but what were you thinking? And all of you scattered and ran for your life when the soldiers came for me. Peter, you did fall away back. But just so you could hang around outside and three times tell a, a girl you didn't even know me. And start at that point. Now let's, let's talk about some things and, and have a pretty serious uh, beatdown. He doesn't do that. He could have scolded them for being unfaithful and being cowards, but he didn't. As Psalm 103 verse 10 says, He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. And so to these who had so badly failed him, at that critical time, Jesus comes saying, Peace be with you. Now the word peace, the Hebrew word being shalom, is the equivalent for both hello and goodbye. But this type of greeting is far more significant than just hi. Because that which he has just accomplished on the cross, according to Romans 5.1 and according to Ephesians 2, that on the cross he removed that wall of separation between Jew and Gentile. He Remove that wall of separation of sin that separated us from God. He made us in himself, all groups, one new person. Now, peace with God and peace with one another. People of this world had shaken their fist, according to Psalm 2, at God and declared war on him. And yet, God is ready to declare peace to those who will believe. And so, while they may have received words of condemnation and judgment, instead, the risen, crucified and risen Christ comes speaking peace. Now, those that are in this risen Christ will share in his identity and share with him now in his mission. Because the Christ who died and is risen is living in his people today. At first, Luke tells us they were frightened when he had appeared, but he alleviated their fear by showing them the marks in his hands and in his side. This was the tangible evidence to them that the same Jesus that they had known before and had been taken to the cross is the same one that stood before them now. It's not a new person that looks a lot like the other person that died. This is that very same one. And now seeing that, we're told they were overjoyed. And once verified by this, Jesus proceeds to open a new chapter. And when he speaks to them now, they're prepared to listen to him. And so we see that to share in the life of Christ is to receive his commission. He says a second time, a second time, he says, peace be with you. Included in that statement is, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. 
Now, just a few chapters earlier, in chapter 17, we have the record of this prayer that he prayed, this extraordinary prayer, praying for them as a high priest would, speaking to his Father, desiring their unity, reflecting on his mission. And in that, John 17, verse 18, it says, he says to his Father, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Now, it just sounds like... Uh, He's giving an assignment. But I'm suggesting to you that we think a little bit more, and we're going to have to pause from this and be a little bit academic in the area of theology and talk a little bit about the Trinity. Because this is one of those unique and, and uh, significant scriptures for those who question what is God. Is there really three persons where you have Father, Son, and Spirit all being mentioned within close proximity? Now we talk about the God the Father and His relationship, and this is going to be very brief of an overview, but in the relationship of the Father to the Son, the wor words that we would use would be eternal generation, that the Father sends the Son. Now that, you know John 3, 16, God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son. Over and over we find this relationship of, of God sending. This is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son. And Colossians 1.15, that, that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn of all creation. Now, of, of Jesus Christ, the Son, we have this unique individual that's fully God, yet fully human. He's fully human with a body like yours and mine, subject to human limitations. And being human, he was tempted in every way as we are, yet he did not sin. But yet... Jesus Christ in the human body was fully God, possessing all the qualities of God, even though he had set aside the use of some of those attributes. He has existed eternally with God. As Colossians 2.9 says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. He is the Lord of all creation. And so he is this unique combination, fully God, fully man, united in one person. Now what that means is, that he is human, but he did not sin. And there's that uh, way of looking at it that cause, really stretches our mind and leads us into areas where we, we can't comprehend. But we just have to accept the fact that, that Jesus, who was tempted, could not sin. And he would not. He could not if he would. He would not if he could. Or you can back it up back and forth and, and realize that he can feel the extent of temptation. This is Jesus. But yet he proceeds from the Father eternally. It's an eternal relationship of going forth. As Micah 5, 2 says, whose origins are from old. And he continually submits to the Father. As he says in, in a number of places, but John 14, 10 being one, don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own, rather it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. And so Jesus is that mediator through whom the Father works. And he is in submission to his Father, viewing his Father as an authority to him. Now we add a little bit more now the, the Son to the Spirit, the third person, as again a relationship of eternal procession that Jesus says he will send the Spirit when the Counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father. This is John 15, 26. The Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about, ye, about me. And he says, unless I go away, this Counselor, the Spirit will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And so we have the Father sending the Son, the Son sending the Spirit. And then the Son saying that the works that I do, I do in the power of the Spirit. And in John 16, he says the Spirit won't speak of himself, the Spirit of truth, but when he comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. This is the work of the Spirit. That's John uh, 16, verses 13 and 14. And then finally, looking at the Spirit, he is deity. Some, because there's less of a 
visible uh, person of the Spirit as there is of the Son, and we can visualize a Father, we think of uh, the Spirit in a more abstract way, and some would almost think of the Spirit as a force or, or something that is just an intangible nothing. But yet the Spirit is described as being fully God, called God, the characteristics of God, attributes, does, doing the work of God being the one who raised Jesus from the dead, and a person with mind or an intellect, emotions. And the intellect does things according to his will. He can be grieved with emotions, and he says that he distributes gifts according to his will. Now, to bring this all together then, that this spirit relationship within the Godhead, that spirits to the Father proceeds from and carries out the will of the Father, that the, to the Son, He empowers the Son, obeys the Son, and exalts the Son. This is what is that incomprehensible reality that has no equivalent to it that we can point to and say, this is what the Trinity is like. But Jesus is speaking of this relationship as he speaks, and he's talking about a relationship of authority and submission, that there's no greater value and lesser value because there is that which is in authority over another. And if you struggle with that idea of submitting to authority, recognize that you're not being a lesser person because someone is in authority within the Godhead. There is that. And so as we look at this in relationship to the home and to marriage, to parents with their children, husbands and wives, within the church, within our workplace and within our civil government, it is godly to be recognizing the authority of one and the responsibility that goes with having someone that answers to you in authority. Now, how do we fit into this? Because when we put our trust in Christ by faith, it says we are in Christ. Now, we enter in, in a certain way, to this unique, marvelous relationship. And so it's, Jesus has pray, prayed in John 15, if, I, if you abide in me and I, my words abide in you, he says, you're going to be able to ask. You will ask because it's going to be the mind of Christ controlling you. And there will be that which you will experience when the mind of Christ truly controls you. I and them in us, or Galatians 2.20, where it says, Paul says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So we are righteous in Christ, clothed in his righteousness. He who knew no sin was made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We are not only raised with him to walk in newness of life, we are exalted with him to the heavens. So, so all of these things that speak of what the Christian life is, the word appears over and over that we are in Christ. So is it any surprise to us then that that which was Christ's redemptive mission becomes our redemptive mission as well? Because to share in the life, to share in the life of Christ is to receive his commission. Jesus said to them, again, peace be with you. As the Father sends me, so send I you. Now Christ re fulfills that redemptive mission through us by the Holy Spirit. I hope that made sense because I can't say that I understand the Trinity, but I think that when you start visualizing yourself in the new identity of being in Christ, that some things should start coming together a little more clearly and it totally will change the way we, we think about ourselves. We don't view ourselves as being the ones that God looks at and says, you lowly thing, you, I don't even know why, why I put up with you. But when we recognize our struggle, we say, we are in Christ. And he's right there with us, saying, let's work on this together. Let's help you 
express the person you truly are because of your new identity. You're not that same person anymore. So we are given the means by which Christ powerfully worked. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. It's the only time we see this taking place is right here in the New Testament. A symbolic act, I believe. It somewhat points back to the Old Testament prophets, but, and that it was a symbolic conveyance of the Spirit. It may be that it's the imagery goes back to the garden when God created Adam and breathed into him the breath of life. And now Jesus is saying, breathing on them and saying, in that same way, you're going to be empowered by the Spirit as I have been empowered by the Spirit. It's not actually going to happen until the Feast of Pentecost, 40 days off from here. But it's a pledge on his part that the Holy Spirit will be coming. And along with that, we are given the message to proclaim of Christ's redemption. This curious statement about forgiving sins causes us to ask, does that give me then the authority to forgive someone else's sin? Are you to forgive my sin? It's a, not a power that was exercised by any of the apostles, never understood by them as they, them possessing this or, or having it conveyed to them. But we recognize that that which was accomplished by the death of Christ was the forgiveness of sin. It's the substance of the new covenant of Jeremiah 31. Their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. Through the book of Acts, the message of the apostles was that through what Jesus did on the cross, you put him there, God raised from the dead, forgiveness of sins is now proclaimed to the world. So, Jesus gives this to the apostles, by extension the church, the privilege of announcing heaven's terms on how a person can receive forgiveness. If someone believes in Jesus, we are authorized by him to announce that by your faith in Christ, your sins are forgiven. Which also means we are authorized to say, and if you refuse Christ, you are still in your sin. It has not been forgiven. For forgiveness is only through him. But there was a work that Jesus was doing that he started to do. And the book of Acts opens with how it was started, and then, in a certain sense, his ascension means that he will continue to live out and accomplish that work through us, in whom he dwells, those of us who are in Christ. So that's a commission. How are we doing? This past week, in light of eternity, and who you are, and what Christ's purpose is to do, if I look back and, and ask, well, how was my time spent? What was most important? What got me upset? What gave me joy? In light of, I'm in Christ. And as the Father had sent him, he has sent me. Do some of those choices then cause me to reflect, what was I thinking? What instilled fear? in you this past week and what were your failures and does that cause you to view Christ as far off and disappointed in you or can you recognize that in Christ we can work on this together in light of the mission that caused the father to send his son to the earth that the son is now accomplishing through us as we consider how that is being, being accomplished, may we not have anything that would cause someone to say, us to say most of all, well, just what was I thinking? In 1988, Carol and I were on vacation in Minneapolis visiting relatives that she has there. It gave us the opportunity to attend the um, conference, national conference of our association of churches. And uh, the list of speakers was pretty impressive. W.A. Criswell, and, who was pastor of First Baptist in Dallas, um, legendary 
pastor with the Lord. Joseph Stoll, who at that time was the president of Moody Bible Institute. But there was a missionary also on the program, Warren Webster. And he had been with our mission organization, and as a little boy, because of my father's, uh, my parents' uh, knowledge and association of Warren and Shirley Webster, who went as missionaries to Pakistan, in our family devotion time of reading the Bible and, and praying before going to bed, there was two missionaries I would pray for each night, and one was Warren Webster. I had the opportunity to go up to him and say, as a little boy, I prayed for you. And this man, who was so remarkably used, was deeply moved that a little boy prayed and said that certainly was significant in that which God did. He was such an extraordinary pe preacher that I'd heard people would say, what a waste that he, he went to the foreign mission field. He should have been here where he could be heard and, uh, and to, uh, to put his, his gifts on display. But he closed the message that he had with such a powerful story. I got the tape and I, and I typed it out. So these are not my words. It was the story that I heard from him on that day of July 5th of 1988. He wrote or said, some years ago in the American South, in the days before modern health and sanitation, plagues and epidemics sometimes spread throughout whole states. It was during one such epidemic that in a particular valley, more than half the community had died. In one home, the father and two children had passed away, leaving a mother and a 10-year-old boy. The mother gave unstintingly of herself, helping in the neighborhood, helping those who were sick, washing clothes, preparing meals, doing whatever she could. And all the while, she knew very well that she might come down with the dreaded disease. She tried to prepare her son for the eventuality. She told him what he should do if the Lord might take her home. If I die, she said, don't worry, son, because Jesus will take care of you. One day she was struck with the telltale symptoms of the high fever, and within 48 hours, the mother was gone. The neighbor ladies, learning about her death, hurried over to prepare her body for burial, while some of the men went out behind the barn and dug a shallow grave. They read a passage of scripture and had a quick prayer, and hurried on to take care of others who were sick and dying. No one remembered the boy who was left behind. For a while, he stumbled back to the house, but the loneliness and emptiness seemed so overpowering that finally he walked out behind the barn where he threw himself down on the warm mound of earth where his mother was buried to be as near as he could to the last one on earth who had ever loved him. And there, exhausted by the events of the day, he sobbed himself to sleep. He slept all through the warm summer night, and early in the morning a farmer going by on horseback saw a body over by the barn, and imagining or fearing that someone else had died, he dismounted and went over to see what had happened. As he touched the boy, the lad awoke and explained to him what had happened. Then the boy added, but my mother told me if the Lord took her not to worry, because Jesus would take care of me. And the farmer, who himself was a Christian, took his cue and said to the boy, That's right, son. Jesus will take care of you, but he sent me to help. The boy looked up and replied, Mister, all I can say is, you've been a mighty long time in coming. <laughs> And then Warren Webster concluded with this, that we estimate that about a third of the people in the world today have not heard the gospel of Jesus Christ in any form, and possibly another third have never had the claims of Christ presented to them in a personal way pointing to a decision. And some of that latter third are your neighbors and mine in America, people who need the gospel. They have every right to say to us, as Bible-believing Christians, you've been a long time time in coming. May we not be guilty of further delay. So remember, God so loved the world that he gave the best he had, his only son. But the question would be, how much do you love? What have you done to demonstrate that love? And how much more can you do? And then he asked us, and when will you begin? As we see here, that we have within us the life of Christ. 
And he has said to us, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. May we enter into the world of our week that is coming, realizing that Jesus Christ is still continuing to seek and to save the lost. It's what his Father sent him to do and what he is now intending to do through us. And may we never let other things so capture our mind that we would look back and say, now just what was I thinking? Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ who died, paid for our sin, and through whom we have forgiveness and eternal life. And thank you, Father, that we now, indwelt by that same Christ, empowered by that Spirit dwelling within us, are the means by which you continue to accomplish that redemptive purpose. Not as if we have been scolded and, and given a job that no one wants to do, but rather to understand this is who we are. It's our identity. And we're forgiven and live in this environment of grace in which He loves us and accepts us. And being within us uses us. May we think differently than we might have before as we understand, put our trust and, and believe in this truth. And may we continue to learn the lessons of, of trust and, and of walking by faith through this, believing that everything you say about the lost and their lostness, but about those who are redeemed and their salvation are things that are true and to live accordingly. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. Yeah.
Here in the power of Christ.